excited to have Bob Elliott with me today. Bob, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation as well. Uh, Bob is the CEO, CIO, and co-founder of Unlimited, uh, which uses machine learning to create replication of what are traditionally expensive strategies that, that typically come in the two and 20 fee structure. Uh, so that falls into the category of venture capital, private equity, and hedge funds. And uh, prior to Unlimited, he spent about 13 years at Bridgewater Associates, the largest hedge fund in the world, uh, the right-hand man for Ray Dalio on his investment team. Um, so a lot of uh, background to talk about. Uh, but but before we before we get into Unlimited and Bridgewater, why don't we start from the beginning with Botany? So tell us about Botany and what you know what led you to uh, the investment world. I always like to say that I was uh, trained as a as a traditional scientist in the sciences, um, and in the specific in uh, in Botany, I, um, I I got a passion when I was a a kid getting into it and uh, had the opportunity to explore it a couple times in high school and do, you know, laboratory and field research work, which then continued uh, into my time in college as well. But over time, probably it was the uh, days upon days in the uh, sixth uh, basement of the biological laboratories using growth ca chambers that I realized that maybe research science wasn't, uh, wasn't going to be the thing for me over time. I, I mean, I love botany and Still to this day, I grow plenty of things <laughs> in my yard uh, as a hobby. But uh, but I realized botany was probably not my long term profession. I wanted to basically more engage in the world and with people and 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 talking to people. And sort of in parallel, I had gotten really interested in develop economics in college and uh, development economics and and public health issues. And sort of realized increasingly that you know macroeconomic. Dynamics are basically what drives the core fundamental outcomes that happen, you know, at uh, a country level or, you know, a cycle or, or a longer term perspective. And so that sort of drew me to, you know, macroeconomics and macro investing as a way to sort of sharpen my skills and my understanding of it. And, and really, you know, it's been it's amazing. I look back, it's been 20 years and and I've really enjoyed Really getting, a, you know, being in the markets, being in the macro economy, it's not, you know, lots of people come to markets for different reasons. For me, I think markets are very much a way to hold yourself accountable to understanding and to push yourself to constantly deepen that understanding and question how much you know and ask the next question and the next question. Uh, it's like a scoreboard of whether you get what's going on or not. And so that's that's really what drives me uh, to think about markets on a daily basis. Okay, and and so you ended up uh, at Bridgewater. Um, and so tell us about that experience. It's obviously a high pressure uh, environment. Uh, so maybe talk about what lessons you learned from uh, your experience there on on you know working, and also maybe uh, we can shift into uh, the investment framework you've developed uh, from your experience there. Yeah, I mean, I think Bridgewater was a great place to develop a deep, rich understanding of how to think about the world from a macro perspective. And in particular, you know, macro, there's a lot of people who think about macro in a lot of different ways. Uh, for me, it was really developing that understanding of thinking about macro in a systematic way, in a data-driven way, systematic approach, you know, building systematic investment approaches. Um, and I think it was a great Makes sense as a scientist, right? As that's a right, scientist, that's right. approach it from that perspective. That, that's right. And I think actually... To be great in markets, you have to have non-consensus views. And part of the way in which you can develop or or I've seen lots of people who have high quality non-consensus views is they come from areas that are not strictly finance. They haven't strictly learned the textbook. And that different way of thinking is valuable in thinking about, you know, the macro economy just as it is thinking about a particular company or or anything like that. And so I think my uh, my way, my development as a as a research scientist was really very important. In particular, in botany, I, I focused on systematics. Uh, so, like, how does all the different pieces of the like plant phloem and xylem and stuff you probably remember uh, or have forgotten from your high school days? Uh, and so, you know, in many ways, the the macro economy is very similar, right? It's a complex system that has a bunch of different intersecting features that you can sort of observe the outcomes of. You know, for the economy, it's markets for botany, it's like whether the plant grows or doesn't or produces, you know, 
crop yield or doesn't. And so those two things are were very related. And I think you know Bridgewater is a great place to develop that understanding of macro, have that historical perspective, which is obviously a very foundational way of thinking about the world from Bridgewater's perspective, but also that pursuit of constantly asking the next question and the next question, appreciating that there's far more to learn about what's going on in the macro economy than there is that you know at any point in time. And so I think that philosophy and that drive was also very important in terms of setting the foundation to become a great investor over time. That's more related to how the economic machine works, right? And and how markets work and and the big drivers of of shifts and trying to predict what's next based on understanding those drivers. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It's really about developing that sort of fundamental understanding of how the markets work. And it's not, you know, I think people can think about systematic investing and they can say, they can think, oh, well, it's, you know, write computer rules and they sort of, you know, drive you wherever you go. It's less about that and more about understanding and thinking that there are fundamental cause effect drivers that drive the outcomes that we're seeing and that, you know, those are not necessarily static. There are ways of thinking about it and and there are certain elements that are consistent over time, but that system is constantly evolving. And so, you can't just say, well, I, you know, for instance, I trade stocks using the yield curve, right? Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, in the last 15 months or, you know, it, it hasn't. Yield curve inversion hasn't been a very good indicator of stocks, you know? And so you can't just take those things on the face value. You have to constantly rigorously assess. But the foundation is that there are fundamental drivers that are driving markets, economies, where they were and where they're going. And if you can understand those those fundamental drivers in a way that is better than other participants in the market, then you have a better view of what's likely to transpire and you can reflect that view in markets. So I'm curious, do you say it's a fair assessment to conclude that there are no certainties or very few certainties? There's just, it's probabilistic, right? Is, is that how you think about it? Part of the lessons from being a macro investor is the humility of getting a lot of things wrong. Um, you know, in in baseball, if you hit over 300, you know, you go to the Hall of Fame. In macro, if you can be 52, 48 on, you know, trades in any given month, uh, that'll make you one of the best investors in the world. And so that gives you a sense as to just how hard it is. And so a lot of what you're doing in terms of if you're trying to generate alpha in it from a macro perspective is you're trying to get some edge, right? You're trying to get that marginal edge and then try and bet that edge over and over and over again so you have large sample size so you can create you know more consistent returns because you know anytime any macro commentator like go you know watch cnbc someone says stocks are gonna go up stocks are gonna go down you know that's a 52 48 kind of bet and so given that given that edge is so hard to develop what you want to do is you want to under create that edge, but then you also want to bet it. And that's part of what systemization is really valuable for, which is it doesn't, it, it both allows you to have sort of these fundamental cause effect sort of rules in terms of how the world is working, but it also is scalable and allows you to apply that understanding more broadly across markets and in, and in a disciplined way so you can get the most out of your edge. Yeah. What you said there is, I think, actually really insightful. Uh, for somebody who doesn't sit on our side of the business, either managing money or, or you know, uh, involved in asset allocation and looking at markets every day, it, it may be counterintuitive to think that fifty two forty eight is is you know is great. Like I think I don't think most people would equate fifty two percent hit rate to a three hundred batter because they know if they went out on the you know and they were trying to hit a hundred mile power fastball, they would never get three hundred. But I think most people think they can probably do better than 52% just, you know, on their own. Obviously, there's selective memory and so on. But but I think it is insightful to hear from you, you know, being in the industry for a long time, working at Bridgewater, one of the most resourced, experienced firms, and to conclude from that all that experience that 52 is actually really good. And, and I agree with you. But, but I think that's something that is often missed. The key thing in that process is having the humility to recognize 5248. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, macro investing, it is not about 
taking big swings highly in highly concentrated positions. I know there's like lots of lore about, you know, some guy speculated on the pound and made a ton of money. Right. I mean, he very well could have lost all of his money uh, as a function. And of he that probably trade. did before. <laughs> and he probably did before. And it's why you see these single trade macro folks. They don't necessarily have consistency. So maybe you call one trade right, but you don't have the consistency over time. You know, the person who called uh, the financial crisis, well, it's very hard to then call the rebound and the downturn, the rebound and the downturn, and keep calling them. And so the part of the key way of investing from a macro perspective is that risk management, because what you do is you, you have the humility to say, I'm probably going to be wrong a lot. Okay, given that I'm wrong a lot, how do I make sure that no one bet is, you know, would put me in a position to, you know, unduly take risk. Uh, and so I think it, it's interesting, you know, risk management, portfolio construction, you know, thinking about the correlations between your different trades, like that is as important in macro investing as is getting any particular call right. And so often, you know, the people who are lauded are the people who are talking about this view or that view. And the people who generate good, consistent returns are carefully constructing portfolios over time. Uh, that is reflective of the humility of how often you can be wrong. Yeah. And, and I guess that humility comes from prior failure or at least seeing others fail. Oh, no. If, you, if you've done this long enough, you have failed so many times. <laughs> That's, that, I think, is one of the things. You could tell, you can tell a person who's a serious investor from someone who, frankly, you probably shouldn't trust, who's overconfident. Because a serious investor, an experienced investor, will tell you the 25 trades that they've gotten wrong. And the and will tell you tell it to you in a way that is you know in detail and why and revi and revisited it and you know they will think deeply about all of the instances they got wrong and why and try and learn from it and the overconfidence trader will tell you all the reasons and all the trades that they got right and that is that is the distinction right that is the distinction that you can quickly see in terms of you know who has really done this for a long time and has the scars to show and who hasn't yeah and and part of that is also keeping an honest track record you know a, lo a lot of people they don't actually write down everything that they've done and and go back and objectively assess okay what's my hit rate so i think part of the humility comes from actually knowing what the truth is as opposed to some, you know, fantasy that you feel is reality, but in, you know, it's not. That's right. It's very easy to remember, you know, to just uh, laud yourself for the good trades and uh, and and forget the bad ones. And it's much harder to have, you know, real money on the line that over time tells you whether or not you're getting things right or wrong. And I think that's why, whether you're a small scale investor or a professional manager, you know. The way to do this most effectively is you got to put the money on the line because there is no better or faster learning tool than putting your views out there and uh, getting it right or wrong and learning as a result. And that's the beautiful thing about markets, right? Markets and investing is you every single day you're getting feedback about whether your understanding of the world is right or wrong. And that's such a great way to hold yourself accountable to constantly be pushing to better understand, you know, the world and, and, and markets. I'm curious, why do you think it is that 50, it's, you know, 52 is good? Um, you know, what, what is it about this industry that may be unique from other industries where, you know, if you're a surgeon, if you had a 52% hit rate, you're not going to be in business you, for you very long. You'll be fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll be fired. In most industries, the 52% other than baseball is not good enough. Um, so what, what is it about investing that makes it unique in that, you know, a little bit better than somebody who knows nothing is, is exceptional? It comes down to the ability to develop high sample size of that. So if you take that 5248, you know, which is that weighted coin and you flip it one time, who the heck knows, right? You know, I mean, like you can't tell the difference between 5050 and 5248 if you flip the coin one time. And part of the idea the, the great thing about markets is if you are prudent with your risk management, what you have the ability to do is if you have an edge, 
then you can bet that edge over and over and over again. And it's not just about betting it at any one time across a bunch of different markets, but it's also about betting that edge through time. Because, you know, in any one month, you know, any one bet in any one month is it's very hard to necessarily know whether you have edge over time. But let's say you put that on 100 times and you do it over 100 months. Well, now you have orders of magnitude more scale in terms of the number of times that you've made those bets. And if you've made those bets enough and you have that edge, odds are you're going to be able to deliver a return that is, you know, more consistent, that generates alpha, right? That That's more consistent than, say, just passive investing. But what I'd emphasize is that there's also limitations. So someone who claims to be 60-40 or 75-25 in their bets is probably lying, maybe not overtly lying in terms of, you know, they may think that that's true, but it's almost certainly not true. It's like, you know, sharp ratios of three don't exist. They don't exist in the world. Sharp ratio is the amount of return you get relative to the amount of risk that you're taking at any point in time. It doesn't exist in the world because if it did exist, people would find those opportunities and erode the alpha away. And so when you hear when you hear people talk about having exceptional track records, the real question is, are they lucky or are they good? And the more exceptional the track record, the more likely they're lucky rather than good. And oftentimes what I've seen is you have exceptional returns for a long period of time, and then you take a massive hit because you had this underlying risk that didn't show itself until it did. And then when you look through the full period, you're just like, you know, maybe 52%. That's exactly right. It's is. I mean, certainly you can construct bets and, and there's lots of implicit and explicit ways in which people sell options. Um, the investment management industry today is chock full of people who are selling options. And in a low volatility environment, you don't have to pay out for them. But in a high volatility environment or a jump to volatility environment, you can have huge gap risk and take losses. I mean, for instance, that are multiples of your capital. Um, and so you're totally right. Is that It's not only just looking at the, the, the winning percentage, it's also looking at how you're winning and the likelihood that you're going to be able to consistently do that. And one of the big risks in the industry is that uh, there is a tilt towards uh, strategies or, or desire to hold strategies that look like they're working over time and then when they blow up, you're like, ah, well, everyone blew up. But that's that's a bad investment strategy, right? What you want to do is, you know, you don't want to create a return stream that looks like up and then down. You want to create a return stream that is as close to a line as possible. And the way that you do that is by having the humility to understand that you're going to get a lot of things wrong and use diversification and use other tools in order to create a more consistent return. Let's uh, dive into that a little deeper. Um, so assuming you appreciate and recognize that your hit rate is probably not very high, talk us through a framework for uh, putting together a well-diversified portfolio that seeks, you know, attractive returns over time. Yeah, I mean, there's there's the old, you know, the old classic view that one of the ways in which you can you can create a good risk return profile of a portfolio is by finding a number of uncorrelated or lowly correlated positions. If you can find, you know, five or 10 lowly correlated positions or zero correlated positions, you can create a portfolio. Uh, if each one of those have a positive expected return, you can create a portfolio that meaningfully reduces your risk relative to the probabilistic return that you'll that you'll see. And so that's really at the core what you want to do with a portfolio when you're thinking about positions. I think all too often people think about positions as individual discrete uh, ideas and don't necessarily think about them at, in terms of how they interact with each other. And so often what you'll find in markets is there are times when you have two positions that are skewed where your positive expected value outcome is actually with different macroeconomic realities. And that's actually really good for portfolio construction, because if you think both of those positions have positive expected value based upon what's likely to happen, the probability of what's likely to happen versus how it's priced into the market, then you can have two positions which are tilted in your favor, but they can pay off under different circumstances, right? And so 
what you want to do is you want to build a portfolio of positions in in a moment in time that is as diverse to the different the different possible outcomes as they can be positive expected value, diverse set of outcomes that generates those positive expected values. And then over time, if you think about portfolios as uh, I mean, portfolios or, or, or alpha uh, is just, you know, you can think about it just like, you know, alpha returns are, are can be thought about just like, you know, stock and bond and gold returns, right? They're just return streams, right? Particularly as you think about this in a systematic way. And so what you want to do is you want to create returns, right, bets on markets, rules that ha- allow you to bet on markets that are as lowly correlated as possible to each other so you can create that portfolio together. So it's about a point in time balancing of your portfolio risk and, and trying to find those lowly correlated positions and a through time uh, way of balancing your uh, your strategies, basically, your your investment strategies in order to create the most consistent portfolio you can. It's kind of like if you're, if you're the casino and you have a, you have, you know, roulette that has a 50, you know, 2% chance of of winning. And then you put that out there and then you put blackjack out there because that has a 52% chance of winning. And those two returns aren't correlated to one another. And you have, you know, millions of users, you're going to win over time. And you go to Vegas and casinos keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. (laughs) <laughs> I, I I love that analogy. It's it's craps and roulette and blackjack. All of those things are totally unrelated to each other. And to be clear, the casino loses sometime. You know, in any day, they might lose on blackjack, or they might you know somebody might bet roulette might hit the particular number. Uh, but the idea is over time, if you have that edge and you have a bunch of different ways to basically bet that edge, which is what the casino is doing, then you could start to create a much more consistent return than if you just had one particular game or one particular you know, table. And obviously, the law of large numbers works over time. That's just math. That's right. And that's why risk management is so important, is that if you have edge, you need to the, – the key to – Proving your edge, taking advantage of your edge is sample size. And so what that means is in any point in time, you have to have good sample size. But it also means you have to make sure that over time that you can bet that over time. Right. And so that's a very important component. All too often, people become enamored in a particular view or position and put on so much risk that it can ruin their ability to generate returns, uh, ruin their ability to continue to pursue those strategies. And so that's why, you know, that's why it's so important. The best investment managers, you know, hedge fund managers, you know, most sophisticated managers in the world, very, very, yeah, they sort of get this view of being like crazy hotshots. The reality is most hedge fund managers are trying to generate a 10% return, right? A very consistent 10% return because that's the type of return profile that's going to allow them over time to bet in, you know, to, to pursue those strategies. And it's the through time that creates lots of sample size for you. Yeah. The best way to compound wealth is not to lose it all in one day. That's right. That's right. There's right. all too often people who from the outside look at giant returns, right? And say, hey, look, shouldn't we have giant returns? And the humble, experienced hedge fund manager, uh, person who's been investing money for a long time, look at those big returns. Uh, And they say, "Ooh, if you're up 100, you could have been down, you know, 75. And that is not a good way to manage money. The challenge is, I think if, you know, I think most people zoom in a lot. So if you zoom out and you have two return streams, one's, you know, more uh, resembles a straight line and one is extremely volatile. And let's say they end up in the same place over time, through time. Uh, you would, if you're zoomed out, you pick the straight line every time. But, but you know, in reality, we're zoomed in. We're looking at the markets every day. We're reading the paper. We watch CNBC. We hear our friends talking about how much money they made. And most people are focused on the volatile line. And it's easy to be drawn towards that after the upswing and, and drawn away from it after a downswing. And so, so you're, I feel like your emotions kind of pull you away from where logic would, would you know, uh, lead you. Um, and so that makes it difficult to implement and practice, even though on paper, it's clear the straighter line is the right path. That's, that's right. And I think it really connects to the behavioral, uh, the behavioral aspect of investors. Uh, there's this paper going around where these academics are like, you know, why would you ever put bonds in your portfolio? 
when you could just hold 100% stocks and get a higher return over time? And the answer, you know, and then you, know, you read the paper and they're like, and what this would require you to do is when you're down 65, 70% in your stock portfolio, you have to ju just hold it. Why, why, would you, why would you do anything other than just hold your portfolio? And it's like, why would you do anything other than hold your portfolio? Like, imagine you're a retiree and you're getting close to to retiring, and all of a sudden your stocks go down seventy five percent. Like that is that is a totally normal outcome. To be clear, that is totally within the range of plausible expectations. For those of us who've been doing this for a while, we've seen we've seen two instances in you know the two thousands and the two thousand eight circumstance where we had a greater than 50% decline in stocks. And we were on that path in 2020 in the matter of weeks for that sort of outcome to happen. We didn't quite get there, but we were on that path relatively quickly. And the problem is like people start to change their behavior when they start to see declines like this. And actually, I think it's been very interesting in the last two years where just the stock market decline that we saw in 2022 caused a lot of people to move to cash because they were they had too much equity risk. They moved to cash right around, you know, somewhere between July and September and have been too conservatively positioned for the rebound. And the reason why that is is because they responded to the conditions. It felt safe to move to cash because they had so much equity risk, because they had so much portfolio volatility, they felt they needed to do something to protect themselves. And what they actually did was hurt themselves in the future because of their behavioral response. Yeah. In my experience, when I talk to investors and I say, you know, the markets are going to go down at some point, most of them would say, that's great. I'm going to buy at that point. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But in, what, what happens is when you actually live through it, um, the news is bad when that happens. The outlook is bad when markets have declined. And so people look at all that. They look at the historical return and it's bad. And they look at Current conditions is bad and the outlook is bad. They'll say, why would I invest? That sounds, that seems stupid to hold the money now. I'll come back when the outlook is brighter, right? And markets obviously move in advance of the outlook. And, and so, so you can justify selling low. I mean, you're supposed to buy low, sell high. You can easily justify buying high and selling low. And it happens over and over again. And I think the cycles are long enough where people, the lessons are lost and people are kind of doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over. And that's why no one has a uh, a negative reaction, a, a, a quick shift to try to to preserve capital if their investment portfolio is down five or ten percent, right? No, no, like you know, we sort of all accept that that's part of the normal volatility if you're trying to generate any returns, five, ten, even fifteen percent. People are pretty good about you know, navigating through those, it's when you move outside that range that people start to respond by preserving capital and rationally respond. I, I remember a very, a very vivid uh, uh, memory in, in March of 2009, when if you remember the S&P 500 bottomed at, at 666, having a, a, a rational conversation, totally rational, evidence-based conversation where I said, well, look, you know, the, the outlook for stocks at that time could be, you know, earnings at 60 and PEs at 10. Like that would have been a totally plausible outcome at the time. You know, this is this is not, you know, random people on CNBC. This is one of the biggest, most sophisticated institutional managers in the world. That was a that was a reasonable outcome, uh, you know, that they could have penciled out the S&P 500 in, in March 2009 at 600. And so that you know, think about that. That that is the mindset that you have, and that what marked the bottom, right? And we had you know fifteen years of incredible equity market performance since then. That is the type of mindset that exists, and so you have to recognize that. You have to say, hey, look, how am I going to respond to that? And much more often, you're better off targeting a lower return over time with less volatility because it's a plan you can stick to than targeting a higher return with more volatility on a plan you can't stick to because you will you will fail at actually experiencing those higher returns. Paper doesn't translate to practice if you can't stay on the ride. It's one of the reasons in alpha strategies why systemization is so valuable because part of the part of the challenge is getting edge. But the other big part of the challenge is actually playing your hand as you need to play it. 
in order to maximize that edge. And so one of the great things about systemization is that it creates discipline to actually operate in the way that you expect to operate. And so that means you, you're getting the most out of your most out of your edge, right? Whereas if you're trading in a very discretionary way, like, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of studies and things like about a judge before and after lunch, like you are that judge, right? <laughs> like your trading is worse before lunch than it is after lunch. Just recognize that if you're trading discretionarily. And the question is, do you want, you know, do you want your edge to be based upon your skill, or do you want it to be based upon whether you just ate or not? <laughs> that's not a good, that's not, I, I know which one of those two I prefer. So let, let's go back to the framework. Um, I, I know uh, we, we've talked about this before, but you think of the world as there's beta and there's alpha. So there are returns that are uh, risk premium that you collect by holding risky assets. So this is kind of buy and hold. You have a positive expected return. And then there are trades that you can make. And, and you know, in, in a moment, we'll get into your market views. Um, but maybe just quickly summarize uh, that distinction between the source of returns and then how you think about balancing those two in a well-diversified portfolio. When it comes down to it, you can generate returns from three different sources. There's cash, the cash rate, you know, essentially the central banks. Set what that is. You, you get it for free uh, and with no risk uh, in T-bills and stuff like that. There's beta, as you say, passive investing. Uh, and over time, you'd expect, uh, you'd expect assets to outperform cash. And the reason why that is, is that the sort of fundamental construct of markets is that you forego the riskless cash return to hand your money to someone, whether it's to lend or to invest. And you would expect a higher return as a result than holding cash. And it's a reason why, if you look back through time, you know, very, very rarely over meaningful periods of time do does cash outperform assets. In fact, you know, over, I mean, over any one year time frame, over any 12 month time frame, uh, you know, it's like 70, 30 that, that assets outperform cash. And so um, the choice to overweight cash is actually an alpha choice. And you have to be darn good at that timing in order to actually have conviction that you should overweight cash since so often assets outperform cash. And then the last choice, as you say, is making bets in markets. And when you think about a portfolio, you want to think about each one of those different pieces in a different way. First of all, you want to think about your overall risk tolerance. I mean, we talked about, uh, we talked about you know, can you absorb 75 or 50% drawdowns in your portfolio, um, or say, for instance, you're getting close to retirement and you really want a lot of conviction about exactly you know, how much capital you have for retirement. And so that sort of gives you the sense of what's the choice between cash and assets, right? The amount of risk that you're willing to take in order to generate in order to generate returns in excess of cash. And so that's different for every individual. And you know, you just want to think about that thoughtfully and proactively to target your return. And then when you think about assets, the real question is, how much do you want to put in uh, in passive investing versus active investing? And there's an important trade-off there, which is you know, passive investing generally has lower expected returns, particularly relative to the risk that you're taking, uh, but it's more consistent, right? More, more reliable. You would expect assets to outperform cash over time. Whereas alpha, you have the opportunity probably to get a better return relative to the risk that you're taking, but the reliability is lower. And so how do you balance these things? I mean, the frank reality is there's no obvious way to do it because you have to take into consideration a, a variety of different things, including how reliable you think one is versus the other, how much skill you think managers have. I think if you look at big institutional managers, they're allocating something like 80% of their capital to beta in one form or another, whether it's liquid or illiquid, and about 20% of their capital to alpha strategies. And I think that basically is about right um, in the sense of, you know, in general, beta strategies are going to give you you know, pretty good consistent returns. So you really want to rely on that. Uh, but alpha can help protect portfolios, uh, general, you know, particularly in, in difficult times. And so you want to put something on it, but you don't want to go overweight it. So something like 80-20 makes sense, which, you know, <laughs> is the answer to every, uh, it's either 80-20 80, 80, or 50-50. Those are the answers to all of life's uh, <laughs> waiting questions. Yeah, that sounds about right. And then I guess it's also 
you know, alpha is a zero sum game. It's a negative sum game if you add fees. You know, in a lot of cases, uh, maybe the the managers can generate alpha. They can outperform, but they take that in fees, and and the investors don't get as much as uh, as they might otherwise. So I think you have to weigh that as well. You know, and passive investing just you know it's heading to zero in terms of cost. Right, and fees. Like the the biggest issue for an investor is fees, and the reason why that is is alpha is uncertain. Fees are certain, right? What whatever the fee is, you know what that that management fee certain. That pass through, let me tell you, it's certain and it's big, right? Those those fees are certain. Whether you can generate alpha is uncertain, and so given that, I think one of the things, I mean, one of the things that's core to what I'm trying to do right now is is to is to bring these strategies, the, these alpha strategies, which are uncertain, but bring down the fees because if you can bring down the fees, you at least know that you're getting, you're, you're, that's a certain benefit to the investor, whereas the alphas are very uncertain. And so uh, absolutely, you're, you know, there's a big difference between your net of fees uh, returns and the gross of fees returns, which the managers see. And I, I'd also add very important is there's also a big difference between what your outcome is before taxes and after taxes. And, and all too often, People don't think carefully about how, in particular, alpha strategies are disadvantaged uh, from a tax perspective. And so um, that adds even more difficulty to adding alpha to your portfolio unless it's in a tax-efficient wrapper like an ETF. Yeah, and we'll get into this in a second. But basically, if you're trying to generate alpha, you're actively trading. And that, by definition, is going to be less tax-efficient than something that's passive. Right. Just by just by definition, you're going to have more turnover, more short term capital gains, um, you know, which are in at least in the U.S. context uh, are are less uh, uh, less attractive from a, a tax perspective. So a couple of points you made is the the 5248, I think, is, is critical. There's in recognizing that you want to be well diversified and you want to emphasize diversification in your portfolio so you don't take a, a massive hit at any point in time. Yet when we, so all that sounds very logical. Uh, you know, I, I obviously as a scientist, it makes perfect sense. Um, as, as somebody who doesn't have a science background, I think conceptually it makes sense. You know, the, the kind of the oldest rule in investing is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and what you're describing is basically how to do that in practice. Um, and then thinking of the world in alpha and beta terms and different streams of returns and how to put all that together. So that's like an engineering exercise. So all that sounds very logical. And, and I think when I talk about that with people, they say, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It logically, it makes sense to be well diversified. Yet, when we look at how most people invest, their portfolios are basically invested in the stock market. They, all their eggs are in the stock market basket. You know, when you turn on CNBC, they're talking about the stock market. Uh, when you read the papers, they're talking about the stock market. Everybody's focused on the stock market. And you ask somebody, how's the market doing? They're not talking about any market besides the stock market. So why do you think there's a disconnect between what logic would suggest is being diversified. And then when you look at actual portfolios, even a 60-40 portfolio, almost all the risk is in the stock market. So what, why, why do you think that's the case? A big part of it is that uh, people's eyes are drawn to the more volatile thing. Um, and so, you know, I think it's not surprising that the assets that get the most capital into them uh, are the highest volatility assets that are, you know, sort of commonly available um, because those are also viewed as the highest returning assets. And I think that that really is one of the like fundamental fallacies of how people think about investing is they don't think about they invest. They think about investing in assets as they come rather than as as economic exposures. Um, and obviously, you know, you, you folks have done a lot of uh, a lot of work on this particular topic, but. You know, there's no the again going back to that paper that says you'd be 100 percent invested in stocks over time. They say a big reason why that is is because stocks are higher returning than bonds, and the answer is like why? Why would stocks be higher returning than bonds? Like if you just hold long duration stocks, like you know, or long duration bonds, you can have bonds that have you know excess returns that are equivalent to stocks. They can have excess returns that are higher than stocks at a certain volatility. You can leverage them. Right, you can buy futures. There's all sorts of different ways that you can unpackage uh, these assets and think about them in based upon their economic risks, independent of what 
your return or volatility target is for these assets. And so I think it is a bit of a fallacy. Like I bet if you ask the man on the street, they wouldn't, you know, you, you mentioned leverage. You have to start to mention leverage to investors. Like, oh, I want nothing to do with leverage, right? And the answer is like your stocks are levered, you know, two and a half times. Like, what, what are you talking about, right? Like you've got tons of leverage in your portfolio. Um, and it's just, it, it, it's hard for people to 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 understand and, and break down those pieces and then put them back together. And so I think that's why folks are just drawn to the highest volatility normal asset class. I think that's an example. I think if, you know, I don't know if Bitcoin had a volatility that looked like 5% a year rather than 500% a year. I don't think anyone would talk about it, right? Because, you know, it, because it just wouldn't be volatile enough to attract people's attention. It could be a good investment. It just wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't attract nearly the interest. Yeah. And I guess there's also a draw towards investing in companies, which makes sense. You think about investing, it's investing in companies. These are great companies. I want to own these. And, you know, X is a great company. Y is a great company. Um, the the index is a basket of great companies. Uh, how can you lose if you just buy and hold great companies? That's right. And I think that 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 unfortunately that desire or that view, for instance, that that you have to have, I mean, even productive capacity of assets in order and yield yield outcomes of assets in order to generate returns. I think. Uh, closes the door to assets that could be highly beneficial to a portfolio like gold um, that, you know, have attractive risk return and correlation profiles that are that are different from what, you know, stocks and bonds provide. And so I, I hear you. I, I think that that's right, is that there's sort of a tangibility of a company and like, you know, Nike produces the shoes that I'm wearing today. Uh, what does the U.S. government bond produce? Eh, it's kind of hard, <laughs> kind of hard to get your head around. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I'm curious, why do you think there's just so much, um, and maybe you disagree, but why do you think there's so much uh, misunderstanding about how the economy works, how markets work? Uh, you know, we're, we're in a world where information is readily available. There's probably too much information. There's probably a lot of noise. But why, why do you think we're in a place where, you know, the average investor doesn't have a good grasp of these concepts? If uh, financial Twitter is any indication, there's certainly plenty of noise out there. <laughs> so much noise. It, it, it very valuable to uh, to you get a lot out of it, but there's a lot of noise. You have to filter through things. I you know I think at 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 its at its core, I think there's a real education gap that exists in understanding uh, economics, and and also I think there's a huge ed, ed, uh, education gap in personal finance. Like we're I mean, it's an example, like we're teaching young kids about farm animals instead of how, you know, they should invest their, 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 their paycheck. Like that is, you know, <laughs> like, uh, and a hundred percent of people will have to figure out how to manage their paycheck. And, you know, 1% of the employment in the U S is, uh, in the farming industry. And so like, that is a fundamental gap that exists in our educational system. And so I think, um, you know, the macro economy is hard uh, to be clear. Lots of things are hard, you know, Writing a good essay is hard. Um, you know, understanding uh, physics is hard. There's lots of different things that are hard, but we don't spend time societally in prioritizing uh, a deep, rich understanding of macroeconomics when it is a thing that affects everyone's lives every single day, uh, which is kind of incredible in a way that they you 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 live your life and you make your personal uh you know your personal decisions when the mortgage rate goes down any person in the market who's thinking about a house, buying a house which is you know two thirds of the people in, in the US buy you know own houses it affects all of those people uh and yet we don't we don't talk about it and so uh i think that's a real gap and i think uh, it's particularly a gap that is harmful for those people who don't have access to this information, I think, you know, increasingly it's becoming more available and understandable for, you know, in, in various channels. But there's still not a good canonical way in which we educate people in the way that we do biology, chemistry, physics, math. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is when I when I look at the other information out there, I feel like there's just a lot of misinformation. It's almost like you be, you would have been better off not hearing that because it could lead you down the wrong path. And, I, and I'm just trying to share some insights that hopefully are helpful to investors. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a it's just such a fascinating field. You know, if you think about, you know, the average person, they have to work really hard to earn money. And then they take that money and they put it in some investment, you know, to save for retirement or, you know, down the road. And and you know, all that hard work could be wasted on investing inefficiently, which when I look at kind of the the average person, it their portfolio is really out of balance. It's basically, you know, one bet and it's just uh it's kind of overly risky and it doesn't have to be that way. I totally agree. And, and it's how they allocate, how you allocate your savings. And then also all the different steps, all the ways in which you can allocate savings, like all the planning aspects, which are so critical, I mean, so, so critical to getting the best outcome that you can. And a place where, you know, if you ask the average person on the street, like, what do you do? Uh, in, what's the most efficient way to save your money? It is not obvious, right? We're not, we don't have these conversations um, with the everyday, you know, the everyday person about how best to save, how best to structure it, how best to create a great portfolio, all of those things, um, you know, it, it, there, there's a huge gap in terms of the education. It's, it's the role. Of the, I mean, the great thing is there's also tons of advisors out there who really understand this stuff well and, and are, um, are out there trying to educate their clients and put them in the best position. So I think there's a there's a there's a, a great force for good that's out there uh, to do this in a in a better way. But there's still a huge gap between what the man on the street understands and and uh, what and and what is actually available to them and, and how to best implement a portfolio. So talking about uh, availability, uh, why don't you spend a few minutes talking about uh, what you're doing at Unlimited and kind of democratizing. Uh, these return streams, trying to make them, uh, you know, low fee, and um, and also maybe spend a minute talking about why you selected the ETF structure. At Bridgewater, I worked with some of the biggest, most sophisticated clients and uh, pools capital in the world, and and what you see, uh, I mean, we 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 talked about it a little earlier. You know, what you see is they put about let's call it twenty percent of their capital in hedge fund style strategies, um, the most sophisticated ones, and. And when you compare that to the everyday investor, uh, they basically don't have access to those strategies at, at all uh, because typically you have to be a wealthy individual. Um, you know, you have to have certain levels of assets uh, to even have the ability to invest in them, and then you have to have access to the funds to actually invest in them. Um, and a lot and of so, the funds aren't very good. And, and, <laughs> on top and a of lot, that. And, and and one of the challenges. You know, one of the challenges for advisors who, who look at these platforms and things like that is, first of all, how do you evaluate all these different funds, but also the negative selection bias, which is very, which is a big deal, which is, you know, the person who – the fund that's taking your $100,000 check is probably not the best fund to be in um, and certainly not the best fund to be in when it's tax structured in an LP structure and uh, you're paying rack rate on fees, uh, plus, you know, platform fees and stuff like that. Like you're talking about a very bad structure. So the biggest, most sophisticated institutions in the world, they invest in these strategies. They have a 20% allocation. The everyday investor basically has no access to these strategies. The other thing in working with these sophisticated investors you see is that when they invest in these these strategies, they invest in a diverse portfolio of them because, you know, any one of these strategies, any one of these managers – they might be good. They might be bad at any particular point in time. Um, but when you put them all together, they actually generate a pretty good return. And so uh, these these institutional uh, investors are actually creating indexes, essentially creating index products. You know, they might invest in 60, 70 of these different managers, which is essentially like buying an index. Right. Uh, whereas, you with, know, with a lot more paperwork, with a lot more, a lot more paperwork, whereas the individual investor you know, if you're an advisor, you're directing folks to like one or two funds, right? There's not, there's not, you know, you're not investing in 70 funds. So they, they invest in hedge funds, they index those hedge funds. And then the last thing, which is a very important thing is those institutional managers uh, beat the funds down in fees. Uh, and so, you know, the idea of paying two and 20, if you're a big, you know, sovereign wealth fund, you don't pay two and 20, right? You pay a lot less than two and 20. And so what they've done is they basically created a low cost, index fund of these alpha strategies. Now, how interesting is that? When you look at what's out in the market, you basically don't, there's nothing that looks like that low cost index fund and certainly nothing that's available for the everyday investor. And so that was the basic idea is we said, look, I bet we could take our experience as 
uh, you know, having built the proprietary strategies and all these different hedge fund styles, I bet we could take that understanding, build technology that allows us to replicate what those managers are doing, not perfectly, of course, but it, but in a way that's pretty good. And because we can use technology instead of investing in the in the PMs, we can basically do it at a much lower fee structure and also in a way that's much more liquid than typical LP positions and much more tax efficient. And the outcome for the investor is the investor cares about net of fees, net of taxes. That structure at a quarter of the fees and half the taxes is much more compelling than uh, than typical LP positions. And because it's diversified, it should create a more consistent return stream, manager diversified as well as strategy diversified. So that's really at the core of what we're trying to do is use those principles, those principles that big institutional investors bring to the table in terms of how they manage their money and bring that to the everyday investor. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that ETF structure has uh, kind of, it's almost like a tax loophole in some ways. I mean, it, almost like a tax loophole. It's a tax loophole. <laughs> like, like, you know, I think it's it's one of the things, not, you know, no reason to beat around the bush. There's a structure, you know, it's been set up so that um, for the investor, it looks like a stock and has all the properties of an individual stock in terms of uh, its tax structuring, which means, you know, typically if you buy it and hold it for more than a year, it's taxed at, you know, your, your capital gains rate rather than your ordinary income rate. Um, that's a great tax loophole to have. It, ETFs are also advantaged relative to mutual funds in that they have the ability to wash the capital gains in the securities underneath. And so therefore, you don't get, you. I mean, in the vast, vast, vast majority of ETFs, there are not capital gains distributions, even for, for products that have moderate turnover. There are not capital gains, there are typically not capital gains distributions that you see in other funds. And so that th what that means is you pay the taxes when you want to pay the taxes, not when uh, the manager you know has has redemptions or when the manager rebalances. That's all very advantageous, and so it's just and, and not to mention the fact that it's transparent and it's liquid and it's a forty act product you know that's uh, SEC registered and at arm's length and you know create has independent custodians and an independent board, which, you know, for, for hedge funds, like, you know, how many times are you looking at hedge funds and you're saying, well, you know, I mean, what's the probability of fraud? I'm not saying that there's lots of fraud, but that is a thing you have to worry about. Well, if the security in an in a ETF, if the securities are held by an independent institution, I don't touch the money, right? I can't touch the money. It's an independent trust that holds the money, not me. It's an independent trust that you know uh, uh, that is highly regulated by the SEC. That's very advantageous from a consumer standpoint in terms of the risk of fraud or or abuse that comes from a manager. Yeah, I've always felt if you could take your total portfolio, whatever, however way you invest, and put the whole thing inside of a single ETF, you'd be in great shape because you're basically putting that tax efficient wrapper around. This is obviously for taxable investors. You can put that tax efficient wrapper around the total portfolio. Obviously, that's very complicated, not easy to do. So short of that, you can try to put an ETF wrapper around those return streams. That makes sense. Most people think about ETFs as um, as like low cost index funds, because that's basically how they started. But the tax efficiency is actually the best with moderate turnover portfolios, uh, because you don't have to take the capital gains in and out. All right. You can put those all into a single wrapper and only take you know, only basically take the 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 taxes, only pay the taxes at the point of sale. And so actually the ETF structure is more tax efficient, better for actively managed strategies than it is even for passively managed strategies, which is pretty neat. Um, I mean, that's that's why I got, you know, I've always been in the LP structure with institutions, which is a whole different game. I looked at the ETF and I said, well, if you look at all these different pieces, it's actually far and away the best structure for the vast majority of investors. Which is also probably why it'll be around for a long time, because it's for the average investor. It's not for, you know, the the ultra wealthy. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's been, just think about it, actively managed ETFs. Last year, they got about 25% of the incremental flows. They might get as much as 50% of the incremental flows here in 2024. That really speaks to the fact that, um, but even if that, even with that, 
you know, actively managed ETFs only represent something like 5% of the overall ETF and mutual fund actively managed market. So there's there's a long way to go here in the evolution of actively managed ETFs. And I think um, people are finally starting to recognize the real advantages that the structure provides, particularly for those actively managed uh, products. So why don't we transition to uh, market and investment outlook. You, you're very active in sharing your your views, your alpha views of what you think the future holds. You know, we're, we're talking about the kind of the 52-48 uh, conversation. Um, uh, I'm curious about uh, what are some of your big themes that you're, you're contemplating that you'd like to share with us? Well, the first thing I'd say is, uh, remember, 52-48, so the probability that anything that I say at this point uh, is is right is about that, right? So just you know that that's uh, I love having that conversation about humility, and then it's like, what are your views? Well, you know, don't don't have too much confidence in any view that I have, but I'll give you what my views are. Um, so take them or leave them. You know, I think most of us in our professional lives have basically experienced two, maybe three cycles. Um, which were relatively acute experiences. So 2020, obviously, I mean, I don't know, was that cycle was like three weeks uh, from top to bottom to back to reflation. The 2008, which was the course of six months, and then the 2000 cycle, the equity bubble pop. Um, and those cycles are not normal cycles. Normal macro cycles are very boring very slow moving. This is that doesn't get any clicks on Twitter when I'm like, the normal macroeconomic cycle is like watching paint dry. You know, stop listening to any of us. <laughs> this is going very slowly. And I think that but that's very important to recognize if you go back to cycles like old time cycles, like in the 60s and the 50s and stuff like that. And so if you think about where we are in that cycle, we're late cycle, the unemployment rates at secular lows, there was a tightening, you know, inflation was elevated, there was tightening, that tightening you know, is very, very, very slowing, very, very slowly slowing the economy, uh, but it's very slow moving. And what we've actually seen instead is that people's expectations of what's going on have whipped around that very, very slow moving moderation in the economy. And that whipping around has created a lot of opportunities. If you think about it, what have we done in the last year? We went, uh, at the beginning of last year, we were going to have depression, a recession immediately. Then we went to hire for longer. Then we went to a banking crisis. Then we went to an AI boom. Then we went to hire for longer. <laughs> then, you know, then we had recessionary dynamics. I mean, we've been through like every macroeconomic state in the course of 12 months. And the, re and the, macro and the reality of the economy is just so much more boring than that, right? I, I, I showed a chart. What? You know what's going, been going on with the unemployment rates? Basically, been the same for eighteen months, right? Like you want to understand what's going on with the economy? It's that there you go. Nothing. Nothing has happened. <laughs> Nothing has happened. And inflation spiked, and it kind of gradually kind of went back. And then down. inflation spiked and came down. And there are obviously there were obviously issues related to the the COVID dynamics and the supply chain things like that. But those things happen, and and you know they, they're sort of one off, up and down. But the basic underlying fundamentals of the economy are very boring, late cycle, tight labor markets, elevated wage growth, inflationary pressures, tightening in response, moderation or slowing of the economy. And that's basically where we're at. And then sort of more tactically, so that's sort of the foundational space of the economy is sort of secularly tight and growth is about it potential. And then on the margin, what we've had over the course of the last you know, 10, 10 weeks or something like that is one of the biggest easing uh, experiences, short term easing experiences that we've, you know, that we've seen in history, which, you know, stocks that are up 20 percent or more bond yields have come down 120 basis points, a huge easing that's basically been injected in the economy. And what you'd expect and that sort of level of easing is typical of of recessionary environments, but not very typical of late cycle environments. And the reason why that happened was a variety of things related to Fed policy, Treasury policy, and inflation coming down. But what it created was an effective easing in a late cycle environment. And actually, what we're starting to see is a reacceleration of the economy. And that's a bit of a dangerous point, because when you get a reacceleration of the economy at a late cycle moment with elevated wage inflation, the risk of inflationary pressures reemerging are are present, particularly after a period where we had such, you know, idiosyncratic but nonetheless meaningful inflationary pressures that existed coming out of COVID, and so that's kind of where we're at. Which is 
we're likely, you know, that's where we're at macroeconomically, likely to have continued pretty good, fine, you know, good growth and very low unemployment and tight labor markets. But the thing that's very interesting is that the asset markets are pricing in wildly different outcomes. Stocks are above highs. They're pricing in, you know, pretty good conditions. Bonds, and in particular, short rates are pricing a lot of cuts. Now, typically, you wouldn't see an environment where you have the economy, you know, unemployment at secular lows, inflation risks elevated, and growth pretty good, and stocks at all new highs, and 160 basis points of cuts priced in. Like those two, those two things are totally inconsistent with each other. And I think that's basically where we stand in the economy is we're, in many ways, it looks like we're back to things that look a little bit like where we were at the beginning of 2023, where people are coming into the year with big expectations of weak economic conditions that are really unlikely to be realized which is likely to put pressure on the bond market, and particularly the short rate market and the pricing of all of those Fed cuts that are currently priced in. Yeah. So in some ways, bond market pricing and stock market pricing don't really match. Uh, it, it's hard. You know, it seems like one of those is probably wrong. And that happens, right? Different pools of investors, different market views, different flows, different things like that um, can, can often create different pricing in markets. And so that's, you know, if you think about this, the question is, where do you have edge? It's about looking at what's the macroeconomic condition, conditions, well, how are they likely to proceed into the future relative to what's priced in? And right now we have a pretty good economy, pretty tight conditions, uh, pretty good asset prices, and bonds are pricing in a terrible outcome. You know, the, right now, if you look at the short rates, December 24 short rates are pricing in a roughly 30% chance of a lower than 3% rate in December 2024. I mean, that, you know, that's a pretty bad, that would be a pretty bad outcome. 250, 300 basis points of easing in the course of a year would be a quite a bad macroeconomic outcome. Uh, but that's priced in at a 30% probability. That seems unlikely doesn't mean it's impossible, but it seems like that prob probability is too elevated relative to the set of macro conditions that we're seeing today. I wanted to go back and clarify one, one point, the, the 5248, um, and then also, you know, macroeconomic conditions are slow moving. So what, when, when you talk about your forward-looking expectations, I assume the odds of getting that right is more than 52%. And and the fifty two percent is more related to trading around those views. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. So, um, the thing about trading, which uh, which makes it fun and challenging, is that to get the bets right, you have to be different from what's priced into the market, and so and correct, and you have to be right. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good one. We have to. You have to be right and different from what's priced in, um, and so that's one of the challenges. That's why it's so hard hard to to make money in markets because there's many times when you know everyone says, "Well, the economy is likely to deteriorate," or "The economy is likely to do well." And yes, you're right. You can have much more high, much higher probability understanding of those things than comparing those outcomes relative to what's priced in. And betting on the markets, which where you have to be not just right about what's likely to transpire with the macro economy, but right relative to what's priced in. When I look at uh, what we've experienced the last, you know, five, ten, even in my career, twenty-five years, and relative to what people had thought was going to happen, it seems like there's been constant surprise after surprise after surprise. Yet when you when you talk to somebody who's a seasoned investor and they've been investing for 30 years or 40 years, they can look back and say, you know, I've seen it all. And, and they feel confident that they have a pretty good sense of what the future may hold. Yet more, more likely than not, they're going to be surprised. I'm curious when you kind of zoom out and you look at, let's say, the last four or five decades, you had the inflationary 70s, the disinflationary 80s and 90s the last decade of the 2000s when growth was the weakest since the Great Depression. And you had this boom and, you know, since since 09, as you referenced earlier, and obviously COVID in the middle of all that. How do you, you know, just in terms of what you feel the next five to 10 years looks like, just from an economic standpoint, do you feel like it's going to resemble one of those cycles that we've seen? Or do you feel like there's just very different dynamics now and it's maybe probably another surprise down the road? 
any one cycle always is some mishmash of a bunch of different experiences um, in history. And and I'll say, while I was not around uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, particularly the late 60s, um, I think that's probably the right feel in terms of what's going on. And I think um, the reason why I say that is I think there's a lot of elements that are that are similar taking COVID aside as a sort of one-off shock that has existed in the economy, which was, un, you know, unusual in its own right. Um, you know, the, the sort of foundations of the macro economy are very similar to the fifties and sixties periods in those cycles where um, you've had, where during those times you had actually relatively significant healing of balance sheets, right. After a, a, a debt problem, you had, particularly as you get into the 60s, you have sort of creeping in inflationary pressures. You have relatively significant deficit spending. Um, in, in You had periods of rising conflict, geopolitical conflict there in the late 60s and early 70s, obviously, which extended into the full 70s. And so you sort of see uh, and you and you see uh, the Federal Reserve response during that period being a bit behind the curve, so letting conditions run a bit hot relative to monetary policy. And I think a lot of the conditions today look like that. Now that doesn't mean you should trade based on you know line up two charts from nineteen you know sixty five to nineteen seventy five and say we're in nineteen sixty eight. It's not that simple, but a lot of the dynamics are very similar to that. And I think it's notable how surprised people have been. In the environment, you know, that, that cycle, that that period, the, the late 60s kind of dynamics and early 70s is something that's sort of fallen out of the consciousness of the professional traders that have existed, right? They've, they've sort of aged out of having had that lived experience. And so it's, it's not surprising to me that this macroeconomic dynamic feels very surprising given essentially no one has lived through a, a dynamic like that. And I think that combines with the fact that uh, the high levels of information availability have created the circumstance where, you know, there's just constantly a flow of information where everyone is trying to catch the incremental turn, right? The incremental data that is the incremental turn. How many, you know, I don't know how many people are here, you know, are listening to this go on Twitter or whatever, but how many single charts, single line charts of this data point or that data point that has called, now we were going to recession because this particular data point, I mean, it's like every day, dozens and dozens of charts in my feed look like that. And I think that that is creating this extreme whipping of expectations around a macroeconomic cycle that basically no one has seen who's traded in their professional lives. And that's creating a set of dynamics that are very interesting. I think it creates a lot of opportunities, particularly to fade extreme market pricing relative to that overall dynamic. But that's, I think that's the, the feel that I have in terms of what we're experiencing today. Yeah, it's really interesting. I remember when 08, 09 happened, and it's probably closest to the Great Depression. And I remember very clearly in 06, 07, there was talk of, could the Great Depression ever happen again? The answer was, no way because we've learned from that. And it, we got very close to it happening again. And it's almost the same time frame where, where that escaped the memory of most investors at the time. That's exactly right. And, and, um, and so, you know, it's why you have to really look outside of your lived experience. When you're thinking about investing, you really have to be outside your lived experience. Uh, and, and I think one of the challenges is you know, people too often rely on their lived experience rather than you know, opening the scope to all the different plausible experiences. That was a big thing, you know, that helped navigate through the 08, 09 period uh, that, you know, having studied in incredible depth the depression and the dynamics there, that was critically important. Um, and I think a lot of people were challenged by, in that particular cycle, the difference between sort of a recession, which is what they knew, and a depressionary dynamic uh, that they didn't know. Um, and I think today we sort of see the same thing where a lot of folks you know, have never lived through uh, this compilation of different cross-cutting forces that um, that are going to drive the macro economy over the next five or 10 years. And so going back to those old time cycles like the 50s and the 60s and the and the early 70s, not to say that it will be literally the same, but the dynamics are very familiar. I think it's very, very relevant to what's going on today.
one notion that you uh, alluded to earlier is the deficits. You know, I think, you know, the way governments are supposed to work is when you're in a boom, you have a surplus. So you save for a rainy day and then you are in a recession and now you run a deficit to, to kind of combat the, you know, reduce spending during that those periods. But in the U.S., we basically, you know, we oscillate between a little deficit during good times and a massive deficit during bad times. And the worse the times, the bigger the deficit. And obviously you have ballooning, uh, you know, government debts that accumulates over time. I'm curious how you, you know, how does this end? You know, it seems like you're kind of abusing the the privilege of being the world's reserve currency. And this is one of those other things that's slow moving until you hit a tipping point. I'm curious how you think about that whole dynamic. There's a lot of governments in the developed world have high levels of debt. Um, and when you have high levels of debt, there's basically, you know, you, you have to, um, you basically have to grow out of them uh, um, at, in some way, shape or form. And you either grow out of them uh, with higher, um, with higher inflation and essentially inflate away those debts or through higher productivity. Um, and so when you think about that process, the first step is transitioning from an elevated deficit environment to a more constrained deficit environment, so less borrowing. Um, and that's a painful transition. And I think we may see that sort of transition happen in a way that is counter cyclical, uh, in a way that could be challenging. Uh, when eventually we get to a downturn environment, you know, we're, we're probably not going to accept deficits at 15, 20 percent of GDP. It's not, not going to happen. And so if you have constrained deficits at a time of economic vulnerability, you, you, know, you could have a more significant downturn than maybe folks expect. But that's in the distance. But first, you have to think about the stages, which is first, you've got to constrain the, the incremental borrowing. Then what happens is you got to figure out how you get your way, how you how do you pay down that old borrowing? And there's basically, as I said, the three ways you inflate, um, you have higher productivity. Uh, and the other option is you can just print money, right? In the in the way that Japan has. And so my guess is we'll see some combination of those. The optimal way of doing it to pay down those debts is through higher productivity. May happen, may not. Wouldn't necessarily bet on it. More likely, we're going to see more inflation and more money printing uh, than maybe people expect in order to retire that debt or at least move it out of the hands of the private sector. And so that's that's really the story. The the good thing, I think, for the dollar as a reserve currency is that there's lots of debt problems everywhere. This isn't a U.S. specific thing. And so basically everyone's going to go through some form of that. And given the fact that the U.S. has the deepest, most liquid capital markets, you know, we may be ugly relative to things like gold, but we sure aren't necessarily, you know, we sure look pretty good relative to a lot of the other options that are out there. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Bob, you've been very generous with your time. I'm going to, I'm going to end with one big question, um, which is, you know, in, in all your years of, of studying markets and your experience, what's the one big unique insight that you'd like to share with us and maybe many have not heard before? It may seem incredibly obvious, but it's so often forgotten, which is when you're thinking about markets, you have to start with what's priced in. That is because everything that you do in terms of your uh, investments and uh, and also whether or not you know you can generate alpha comes down to how you see the world in the future relative to what's priced in. And I always like at the beginning of the year, uh, it, it's a good time to just take a minute, take stock. What is actually priced into these markets? Um, while it many times is the easiest thing to do because it, it can be relatively well known uh, and measured, it's the thing that gets forgotten. And so particularly in this environment where we have these expectations whipping around relative to the reality, having a firm foundation there, starting with what's priced in and then going to what's likely to happen is going to be a, a very advantageous for investors. That's great. Bob, I appreciate it. It was, it was great uh, chatting with you. Uh, I, I, I love the insight that you shared. Uh, so thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was great. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please visit our website at insightfulinvestor.org to access past shows and learn more about our podcast. If you have questions, feel free to email us at info at insightfulinvestor.org.
And if you enjoyed the discussion, please subscribe to this podcast to ensure you don't miss future episodes. And don't forget to forward today's conversation to others you think would enjoy listening. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Evoke Advisors, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations, nor reference past or potential profits. And listeners are reminded that securities trading, commodity trading, and alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors.